Item number 6011 Level 2 Restricted Containment Class Safe Disruption Class Dark Risk Class Notice Item number SCP-6011 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Provisional Site-044 is to encompass SCP-6011. Human development within a 10km radius of SCP-6011 is to be prevented under the guise of the area being protected by the Libyan government for conservation purposes. SCP-6011 is to be stored in a hermetically sealed chamber. External stimuli are to be kept to a minimum. An adjustable monitoring system is to be deployed perpendicular to SCP-6011 as per the aforementioned criteria. Interactions with the SCP-6011, its mass, and or instances of SCP-6011-1 must be approved by the acting head researcher of Provisional Site-044. SCP-6011 is a circular area located in the Central Sahara Desert with a radius of roughly 500 meters suspended 5 centimeters in the air. The area is situated 156 meters below the ground within limestone karst, in which it was originally discovered. As the transport of the object was neither possible nor practical, Provisional Site-044 was erected following the unearthing. SCP-6011 has no thickness and behaves like a two-dimensional plane. Three-dimensional objects pass through with no resistance. However, when attempting movement along its axis, the matter present within SCP-6011 will react, abiding by the baseline laws of thermodynamics. Balanced shell electron pair propulsion and molecular orbital theories are applicable and result in the molecules as well as the orbitals represented on the XY axis alone. Both the inorganic and organic material found within SCP-6011 exhibit properties similar to their three-dimensional counterpart, existing in all states of matter accounted for in the baseline reality. Compounds that require three-dimensional configuration to perform their functions can exhibit them within SCP-6011 through unknown means. The designation SCP-6011-1 collectively refers to organisms inhabiting SCP-6011. The smallest unit of the aforementioned organisms is cell-like in nature. Instances of SCP-6011-1 can be divided into three basic branches of life, termed Explicitus archaea, similar to archaea, Explicitus bacteria, similar to bacteria, and Explicitus eukaryota, similar to eukaryotes. The variation between the different single and multicellular instances of SCP-6011-1 garners them being placed into their individual species. Reproducing both sexually and asexually, all species of SCP-6011-1 are based on a genetic code similar to DNA, exhibiting both genetic heredity and mutation. Proteins assisting in the coiling of the genetic material are present and affect the gene expression although their two-dimensional nature prevents the formation of chromosomal-like structures and instead results in the genetic material being stored in a form of two branched fermat spirals. Endo- and exocytosis is achieved through the opening of U-shaped proteins forming the cell membrane. A protein synthesized in preparation for cytosis is used to break the intermolecular forces between the membrane, allowing the material to pass. This process is highly regulated, as osmotic lysis occurs when both sides of the U-shaped proteins are opened. Among the fauna of SCP-6011, absorption of food is most commonly accomplished through mouth-like structures, and most species perform aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Since the anus is not present, as the two-dimensional configuration does not allow for gastrointestinal tracts, the waste product is regurgitated through the mouth following digestion in the stomach. Fauna of SCP-6011 developed an immune system and physical adaptations capable of combating the majority of bacteria and feces through natural selection. Photosynthesis is performed by numerous species of flora. Due to the sunlight being fairly scarce and directional, such as all plants blocked by any amount of opaque mass will find themselves atelulated, 
the majority of flora is capable of performing rapid phototropism. As directional gravity is not present, the roots of plants grow towards the sources of metal, usually the iron-rich soil, using a form of advanced magnetotropism. Light-sensitive, eye-like structures located on some specimens of SCP-6011-1 are capable of perceiving the environment within SCP-6011 as a one-dimensional line. Their perspective is determined by the distance between the light bouncing off the perceived object and the sensory organ. Objects in close proximity appear brighter than those further away due to the scattering of light. Using this method, shapes can be distinguished. This is done in a similar vein to three-dimensional entities perceiving depth through the use of two-dimensional images. The Plana hominem is a sapient multicellular species of SCP-6011-1. Members of Plana hominem possess features similar to that of a human side profile, with a distinguishable head housing a brain, a nose, and a singular eye. The, the integumentary system, muscular system, lymphatic system, respiratory system, digestive system, nervous system, endocrine system, cardiovascular system, urinary system, and reproductive system are also present. As her eye is stationary and facing to their left, instances of plana hominem must orientate their entire body to achieve 360-degree vision. Possessing three types of cone cells, the vision of plana hominem is similar to that of the human visible spectrum. Locomotion is performed through an arrangement of motile cilia-like structures moved by the hydrostatic pressure from blood circulation. Though primarily used for locomotion, grasping can be achieved. Sol Beta is a miniature rotationally locked star, possessing features equivalent to a red dwarf. It measures 4 meters in diameter, creating a dead zone with a 50 meter radius, outside of which its solar radiation is not detrimental to the climate and life of SCP-6011. The average temperature in areas located 250 meters away from Sol Beta is only 18 degrees Celsius, considered to be tropical by both the local fauna and flora. The geological landscape of SCP-6011 is varied, and subject to a frequent change, due to the lack of seismic activity. A large accumulation of solid water covers the circumference of the plain, with the average temperature within the immediate proximity measuring minus 40 degrees Celsius, due to its distance from Sol Beta. Small bodies of liquid water, maintaining structure through its cohesive nature, are scattered throughout. The meteorological conditions of SCP-6011 consist of infrequent rainfalls caused by the accumulation of water vapor, with occasional snow. There is no distinction between seasons. Cooled by the frozen circumference, the clouds move clockwise throughout the day causing rainfall once the water condenses. Both the time and direction system of Plana hominem is based on its meteorological system, with the distinctions of cardinal directions done by the periods of rainfall. North is designated by the direction of the rainfall at 12 o'clock, east by the direction of rainfall at 9 o'clock, etc. Looking at SCP-6011 is curious. It could give one a feeling of power being able to survey the entire world with a mere glance. Every rock formation, building, and even the inhabitants can be viewed with ease, as if looking at an oversimplified diagram. When I look at an instance of SCP-6011-1, I do not see a singular entity. I see all their organs working in unity. I see their digestive system moving, their eyelids appearing from the space behind their eyes in which they are tucked and their hearts beating rhythmically. If I were to zoom in closely, I am certain I could see the individual neurosynapses firing in their exposed brains. We had prior interactions with entities that claimed to originate from higher geometrical dimensions, yet our mind was never really capable of understanding them. Where we stand, we have the capability to imagine the lives of those in a two-dimensional space. Sadly. The same cannot be said for our understanding of the four-dimensional reality. It is often said that the human brain is like a computer. So just like a computer can never completely emulate a machine more advanced than itself, 
so do we lack the ability to understand higher dimensions. Dr. McCullis Addendum 1 Xenoanthropological Report of SCP-6011 The Department of Xenoanthropological Studies Fast Est Ab Hoste de Seri Social Structure Instances of Planet Hominem live in a feudal-like society, with the role of the parents passed to the offspring. There is a clear social hierarchy, with the people divided into estates. Those estates, indicated by the coloring of the body applied below the skin at birth, strictly follow their social structure. One cannot move down or up their respected estate. Any deviation from the said hierarchy could result in an individual getting placed into a mental asylum, the role of which has not yet been replaced by a proper psychiatric hospital. It must be noted that the social classes mentioned below are broad classifications. Red, Archduke, the monarch of SCP-6011. Orange, administrative positions. Yellow, priests, scribes, and record keepers. Green, similar to middle-class citizens of 18th century Europe. Teachers, physicians, lawyers, etc. Blue, merchants, tradesmen, and skilled workers. Purple, manual laborers. Color and its cultural importance. Much cultural emphasis is placed on color. Colors with higher wavelengths represent value and are commonly used to distinguish the central characters in art. This application of color is primarily used as a way to most easily distinguish between the social estates, as differentiating between individuals from facial features alone is a great task and an acquired skill termed facial recognition. Servants As many everyday tasks cannot be performed by a single individual due to their bodily limitations, it is considered proper and even essential for higher class citizens to own no less than two servants. Whether paid or enslaved, the servants must come from an estate below the green one. Requiring assistance of a friend or family member to perform tasks requiring two is considered a sign of poverty. Technology The technological level of development within SCP-6011 is considerably low in many aspects. Germ theory is yet to be developed, and the belief in the spontaneous generation is just beginning to be publicly scrutinized. As two-dimensional nature does not allow for a formation of an axle, and the gravitational force not moving the matter in any particular direction, wheels are applicable for neither transport nor gearing. Voice scribes. While physical writing on the surface is possible, it is not practical. As such, leagues of voice scribes are trained amongst the yellow caste. Their sole purpose is remembering and regurgitating a large amount of information. It is usually a role of a singular voice scribe to recall an entire tone, transcription of a speech, or a particular law. Entertainment Due to their inability to accompany more than one row of viewers, visual theaters are seen as a form of luxury. More popular are the voice theaters, where more emphasis is placed on the sound of both the artificially created ambiance as well as the dialogue. Entertainment in the form of social games is prominent and played amongst all social classes. The most popular competitive board game is titled Regicide. Played on a one-dimensional board, Regicide shares many characteristics with chess, involving both a central piece, the capture of which results in the end of the game, titled the Archduke, and different movesets for individual pieces. While two-dimensional Regicide is possible with the use of transparent playing boards, the movement of the pieces is considered troublesome, and the sport as a whole a novelty. Addendum 2 Interaction No. 6011 September 6, 1914 Test Group A Designation, Preferred Name, Sex, Estate, Note Alpha Iotis Male Green Professor of Physics Beta Femnar Female Green, spouse of Subject Alpha, employed as a lawyer. Gamma, Emenius, male. Green, oldest son, only child of legal age, currently unemployed. Delta, Bicrea, male, 
Green, Youngest Son Zeta, Gralala, Female, Green, Oldest Daughter Ada, Chrissy Haya, Female, Green, Youngest Daughter Theta, Cac, Male, Purple, Servant of Subject A Note, While there was a mention of the Subject Alpha and Beta having two more daughters, empirical proof of their existence is not within the Foundation's possession. Forward, an educated member of the Green Estate, named Iotis, was chosen as Subject Alpha for an interview regarding the nature of SCP-6011. As the subject spent the majority of their time within the city north 0.55, south minus 0.34 Rolalo, an attempt at the initial interaction made within Subject Alpha's household at 11.30, SCP-6011-1 time. Begin Log Subject Alpha Study South Engaged in a solo game of regicide. Subject Beta Bedroom Southeast Repeating sentences regarding a legal case to itself, possibly a form of rudimentary voice scribe training. Subject Gamma Bedroom West Sleeping Subject Delta Bedroom Northwest Sleeping Subject Zeta Bedroom Northwest Sleeping Subject Eta Bedroom Northwest Sleeping Subject Theta Kitchen See Cleaning Dishes a short high-pitched noise was played in a speaker suspended 5 cm above Subject Alpha. This was done to test its hearing capabilities. Pardon? 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 Head north. We'll commune further there. Distressed, Subject Alpha rapidly turns around the room. Excuse me, sir, or madam, but could you please state your direction? I am incapable of facing you. That is not necessary. Please head north. I do say it is necessary. It is only proper for visual contact to occur during a conversation. But then again, your voice is hard to distinguish. Just a moment. Your name is Iotis, right? That is right, but sir or madam, I simply must know where you are. Subject Alpha is making its way around the room, feeling the walls. Iotis, please stop moving. I believe that a call to the police is in order. How have you entered my private quarters? Goodness me, goodness me, a thief, a thief, a thief! Your daughters and sons are disturbed by the noise you're making. Do you realize that? Subject Alpha slides the door leading to his chamber open, inspecting the hallway before retreating inside. Where are you? How do you know about my children? Goodness me, goodness me, a thief, a stalker, a thief and a stalker! Subject Alpha continues inspecting his chamber. Subject Beta enters the chamber of Subject Alpha. Sir Iotis, why are you screaming, Sir Iotis? Ah, Madam Fimnar, horrible news! A thief, quickly! Inform the police while I take the children somewhere else. Go, Madam Fimnar, go! Subject Beta exits the chamber of Subject Alpha in haste. Listen to me, Iotis. I am not a thief. I am not a stalker. I am… I'm a messenger. That's right, a messenger. Please, if you could just cooperate, I can assure you that your family will be fine. Anything. I'll do anything. Yes, very good. Now, please stop shouting and move back to where you were. Subject Alpha moves towards the south of his chamber. Please, do not use the hoi polloi language in my household. Just say south side like a proper gentleman or lady that you are. That being said, your voice is difficult to distinguish. Oh, pardon. I am a sir, a doctor. You're an educated man yourself, correct? Yes, I am a professor, sir. Is this what this is all about? Do you wish for me to use my talents free of charge? Iotis, we want nothing from you except your time. Very well, very well. I am here, I am listening. Could you please at least show yourself? Just a moment, Iotis. A mechanical piston is lowered into the service of SCP-6011, before being retracted. Pardon? 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 That was one of our devices. Did you see it? Yes, yes, I did. Metallic it was, and round. But it disappeared. As I mentioned before, we require your cooperation. 
I'll be as clear as I can in explaining what just occurred, and you will listen. Understood, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two members of law enforcement from the Blue Estate approached the house, accompanied by Subject Beta. Subject Beta answered the front door. Iotis, we will continue our conversation. Tomorrow, head north side of your house, just past the large lake, just past the white rock. We'll talk again. Right now, I can see two policemen approaching your house. No wonder, you were loud. What? How? Angel? Angel? Where are you, Angel? End log. Closing Statement Subject Alpha was fined for noise disturbance. While I understand the initial concerns at breaking our absolute veil over SCP-6011, an interaction needed to take place sooner or later. Subject Alpha, Iotis, made no attempts at recalling the events. It appears like Subject Alpha mistook our interaction as a sort of divine intervention. While incidental, this oversight could be exploited in further interactions. Dr. McCullis Addendum 3 Seminar regarding SCP-6011 at Site-19 Forward Following the events of Addendum 2, Subject Alpha performed several other interactions with the research team of SCP-6011. As further data was collected, both from the testimony of Subject Alpha and empirical observations, Dr. McCullis found it appropriate to put together a seminar accompanied by a Q&A section regarding SCP-6011. I want you to imagine a place in space, a point, the center of a circle, a singular point in space, and then another. Now, imagine a line connecting the two points. Now, our space has a length. It has dimensions. It has direction. To give our space an area, we need to draw a line perpendicular to our first line, to give it volume. Another line must be drawn perpendicular to the other two. This is what many of us call the baseline reality, a three-dimensional space. When even one of the aforementioned perpendicular lines is removed, an object would no longer have volume. Could such an object have mass? In our baseline reality, the obvious answer is no. Mass has density, and density calls for volume. However, ladies and gentlemen, despite most of you being junior researchers, you have all interacted with that which does not make any sense by the mainstream science. How does an object become anomalous? We don't know. And if we did, it wouldn't be anomalous anymore. One such object was discovered by the colonial forces of Italy in 1912. Of course, it seemed like an extended form of the cave system to them, and the public shall know it as such. Inside the cave system, we found SCP-6011. If you could please look at the screen, I would like to introduce you to our informant. I know he doesn't look like much, and the little guy is only about 5 centimeters in length, but what you are seeing is a sapient creature originating from SCP-6011. He told us a little about his world, and while asking us to return the favor, we were hesitant. It believed that we were an angelic entity of some sort, and can you really blame him? Imagine someone suddenly appearing within your house. Imagine someone describing the direct shape of your insides while informing you of what your relative across the country is doing. Would you also not cry out, Angel, Angel, where are you, Angel? I see you laughing, yet there is nothing comedic about our testing period with Subject Alpha. It did involve some distasteful tactics that I, as a xenoanthropologist, am not proud of. But it needed to be done. We could no longer observe. We needed an expert and Iotis was the closest thing this world had to a doctor. While most of our data of the xenoanthropological kind was kindly provided by him, we filled in the blanks with our own observations and corrected for any biases. Today, I wanted to talk about what was not included in the main 6011 files. Things that were not deemed valuable enough and other information of curiosity. Something to make you think, and perhaps consider an assignment of Provisional Site-044 or at least give my recently published book, The Life in Plain, a read. It was actually co-authored by our very own Iotis. As you have all read the file, there is no reason for me to repeat myself. I will move straight into the Q&A section. Please, tell me what you want to know. 
Can you say something in the language spoken by the sapient instances of SCP-6011-1? In plana hominem. Yes. Yes, I can. English. It's not good for my throat, I reckon. It is very coarse language, yet oddly soft. Let's say that I placed my finger within SCP-6011 and moved it toward the rock formation. Would my finger be slashed in half due to the SCP-6011 being infinitely thin? Firstly, SCP-6011 isn't infinitely thin, as it has no thickness. Your finger would be fine, as the two-dimensional projection of your atoms would simply interact with the rock as expected, abiding by our understood laws of thermodynamics. For future reference, please do not place any appendages within SCP-6011. Is there any apparent reason for the sapient instances of SCP-6011-1 to look human? Truth is, do they even look human? Or is it natural for our brain to make connections between vaguely humanoid-shaped objects, as we want to feel a sense of familiarity with them? Philosophy aside, no. Not that we know of. How do we know that SCP-6011 is actually a two-dimensional space? We ran tests involving beta emitters. The received value stands in line with that expected from an environment with a high concentration of gases rather than anything solid. We also created a form of vacuum in SCP-6011, with the results once again agreeing with us. So yes, if SCP-6011 had width, we would have detected it by now. Can mass be removed out of SCP-6011? I am glad that somebody asked that, since this will save me some time with future testing requests. To answer your question, yes. Hypothetically speaking, mass can be forced out of SCP-6011. However, we do not want that to happen. You have to understand that particles within SCP-6011 have a two-dimensional configuration. They would either rearrange themselves to fit into a three-dimensional configuration or split apart in the baseline reality. The worst thing that could occur would be the removed mass undergoing instantaneous nuclear fission that would release zero joules of energy. Besides. It is a standard protocol to avoid removing mass from a closed system. Opposite of the previous question, can mass be moved into SCP-6011? Yes. Actually, no, it's complicated. You can place a cross-section of a mass, but the actual mass itself will remain in the baseline reality. If we wished, we could place a piece of carbon for the instances of planet hominem to ignite using a flame. While the cross-section would inevitably burn, leaving us with two pieces of carbon sliced neatly at the intersection, the mass of carbon would remain the same, rinse and repeat, infinite mass, infinite energy. As I mentioned before, changing the enthalpy of a system is never advised. Addendum 4 Incident No. 6011 January 12, 1916 On January 12, 1916, there was a malfunction in the motoring system that caused the breakdown of the camera rails and dislocation of several metallic components into the surface of SCP-6011. While the object sustained no damage, the phasing of the components was witnessed by several citizens of City North 0.55, South negative 0.34, Rolalo, above which the monitoring system was momentarily suspended. While it was initially suspected that a state of panic would result from the sudden entry and exit of mass in such a public space. The rapid return of the status quo resulted in a research team deploying anti-cognito hazard screening in order to locate the source of the apparent disregard following the initial event. Images from the anti-cognito hazard screening were analyzed, discovering that a sizable building, obscured by a form of visual cognito hazard, was located at north negative 0.99, south negative 0.20, an area previously marked as a wasteland. The building, shaped like a regular octagon with a side length of 100 cm, resembled a standard holding facility. Following the deployment of auditory anti-cognito hazard screening, the research team managed to record a voice scribe reciting the information regarding incident number 6011, January 12, 1916. The creation of the obscured building, Cognito had her deployed following the incident, and the subsequent capture of Subject Alpha 
can all be attributed to a veiled organization acting within SCP-6011, designating themselves as Doctors of the Church. The group, comprised mostly of members of the Yellow and Orange Estates, with a small task force of green, blue, and purple field agents, hold similar mission statements to the SCP Foundation from the baseline reality. This encompasses their attempts to uphold the veil of secrecy between that which they consider anomalous, three-dimensional mass entering the SCP-6011, and the general population, as well as their will to understand the nature of such phenomena through the application of science and theology. It was further discovered that SCP-6011 would have become dislodged from the baseline reality following the initial textile interaction were it not for Doctors of the Church and their deployment of reality anchors. A two-dimensional cognitohazard made for protection from extra-dimensional threats. Two-dimensional reality anchors. Truly, I am speechless. Doctors of the Church, referred to as the Little Foundation in jest amongst the research team, are an interesting group of interest. When I look at them, I see, well, us. A little crumb of limestone falling from the ceiling of the karst or a bug somehow making its way onto the surface of SCP-6011, phasing in and out of existence, must have terrified them. And so they found a way to conceal all that was illogical from the general public, as did we.